to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The scripture says, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse number 24. We welcome you today to our study of the subject, to our study of the subject of worship. Worship is one of the great themes that you find in the Bible as man has that, that ability and that privilege to humble himself before his maker and to praise and honor and magnify God for the many wonderful blessings and benefits he's given toward his children. In this series of lessons especially, we're going to focus on items or actions of worship, specifically that Christians may do in a corporate worship setting. When we go to worship on Sunday morning or Sunday night or when we gather with a group of Christians, what are some of the things that God has given us the privilege to do in our worship? And how do we do those in such a way that it brings God the glory and the honor that He deserves? We always want to encourage you to visit our website, especially thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, you can find all of our study material, free DVDs and CDs of all our lessons are available. You can watch those online or view those online and listen to them online, or you can request free CDs and DVDs of all of our lessons from our website or from the information given at the end of this program. And we also encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. If uh, there's a Church of Christ in your area, we'd love for you to stop by and visit them. They're friendly people who love God and love His Word. We just encourage you to stop by and visit your local Church of Christ in your area. As we think about the subject uh, of worship and Christians especially gathering together to worship today, we're going to focus on the subject of prayer. What does the Bible say about prayer? If you've been studying your Bible long or were raised in a family where people believed in God or the church, you've probably seen that prayer is a vital part of the Christian life. And so we want to focus today on that wonderful subject of prayer. And friend, as you think about prayer, Jesus in His own life and ministry illustrated the power of prayer. In Matthew 14, verse 23, as Jesus had been teaching and healing and feeding the multitudes, the Bible says that when Jesus had sent the multitudes away, He went up by Himself on the mountain to pray. Jesus realized in His own life the importance of prayer. And friend, it is such a vitally important subject and, and part of the Christian's life. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17, the Bible says Christians ought to pray without ceasing. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. James chapter 5 verse number 16. And so we want to illustrate some things, we want to share some things from the Word of God today that will help us to be better in our prayer life and understand more fully God's plan for prayer. And so if you don't have your Bible, we want to encourage you to take just a moment and get your Bible and follow along with us as we're going to think about worshiping God, giving God the honor, the praise, and the glory He deserves through our prayers. Let's think first of all about some fundamental Bible teachings that are very simple about prayer. And here's the first one. Prayer is something the Bible teaches that we must be taught how to do. We ought to be taught how to pray by God, by the Scriptures, and by Jesus Christ. It's not something that I just wake up one day and naturally know how to do. God teaches me in His Word how to pray. Let me give you an example of that. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray 
as John also taught his disciples to pray. And of course, you could have no better teacher than the master teacher, Jesus Christ, on the subject of prayer. But I want you to notice something interesting from that text. Jesus' own disciples wanted to be taught by the master how to pray. Friend, if I'm going to pray the way God wants me to, uh, about the things God wants me to pray in a way that will bring honor and glory to God, I need to be taught how to do that from the Scriptures. I want to study Bible passages that teach us about prayer. I want to see what is it that God teaches me to ask for in prayer. I want to see, does the Bible say that prayer is just an opportunity to maybe ask God what we need, or is it more or just as much an opportunity for us to praise and honor and magnify God with our lips. And so prayer is a learned trait. Learn from the scriptures and learn by looking at examples of men and women who prayed in the way God wants them to. You know, another fundamental that we learn about prayer is that when I pray, I need to pray with a firm belief and with a true heart that God will bless us and answer our prayer if it's according to His will. I want you to notice with me the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 11. Jesus discusses this idea of praying with faith or praying with belief, and He says this in Mark chapter 11. Notice verse number 24. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now we understand that that's qualified by praying according to God's will. But if it's God's will, and I pray for it, I don't need to think, well, maybe God will do this, or maybe He can do this, or, you know, prayer is not a, a maybe, it's not something that a wishful thinking is not the idea. Jesus taught us to pray with belief. You see, we're praying in faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. If I pray in faith, I know there is a God. I know that God hears the prayers of His children, that He cares for us and tells us to do that. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. And I know the Bible teaches that if it's according to God's will, 1 John 5, verses 13 through 16, that He is more than able and willing to do that. And so when I pray, I need to pray with firm belief. I need to have conviction and faith that God does hear the prayer of His children. But friend, another fundamental about prayer that will help us to pray in such a way that it really brings glory and honor to God is we need to pray according to the will of God. I want you to notice a passage from the book of 1 John with me. It's found in 1 John chapter 5, and I want you to look in your New Testament in verse number 15 as John teaches us something very important about prayer. Notice 1 John 5 verse 15. The Bible says, And we know that He hears us, that's God, that God hears us, whatever we ask. We know we have the petitions that we've asked of Him. Now, you'll notice John says he hears our prayers. We knows he knows that he hears our prayers. But then in 1 John 5, 14, John tells us why we can have such confidence in that. Look back one verse to 1 John 5, verse 14. How can we have such confidence? This is the confidence we have in him. Notice this. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. There's the idea. How can I be confident? How can I have such faith in that God's going to hear my prayer and bless that? If I'm asking according to the will of God. Now, friend, here's the contrast of that. Two people stand up to pray. One fella stands up and he praises God. He honors God. He's trying to live a good Christian life. And he prays to God, Lord, as I'm striving to seek first your kingdom, Please take care of me and my family. We're talking about food. We're talking about shelter. We're talking about clothing. We're talking about spiritually as well. Another man stands up to pray. That man's a, a pious man. He's proud in his heart. He thinks, you know, that he's the next best thing to, to, to being a, a Christian that you could ever imagine. And he prays, God, bless me. Make me wealthy, happy, and healthy, and give me a million dollars, whatever it may be. 
Which of those two men is God going to answer their prayer? Which, which of those two prayers is going to bring glory and honor to God? Well, not the man who's asking for a million dollars, not the man who's asking to be wealthy and all these things. Now, God may bless someone in that way, but that's not praying according to God's will. God's never promised that if I pray for a million dollars, He's going to bless me with that. But you know what God has promised? Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things shall be added unto you. I want to pray in a, in a mindset that is according to the Bible. I want to, that's why being taught how to pray is, is so important. You know, sometimes we pray, uh, don't, don't let us face persecution. When in reality, the Bible teaches that I am going to face persecution. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, verse number 12. Why should I pray for something that God says is going to happen? Instead of praying that it won't happen, I ought to pray that God will give me the strength, the courage, the fortitude of faith to not give in under persecution. This is why James would say in James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. One of the things I ought to pray for is the wisdom to know how to discern God's Word, to know what to ask for in prayer, and to pray according to the Scriptures. And so a great fundamental here is let's pray with a mindset and an understanding of God's will, for that's the way that we can truly have confidence in our prayer life. But you know, as we think about fundamentals that really bring glory and honor to God as we worship Him in prayer, here's a real important one. I want to pray. When I approach God's throne in prayer, I want to pray with a, a very humble and contrite attitude. Luke chapter 14, verse number 11, Jesus said, Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I want to have the humility to know that, that God's the Creator. That, that I need God's mercy and grace, and without God I'd be nothing, and that I stand, I stand in awe of the almighty power of God. Now, let me give you an example of this from the Scripture. I want, to, I want to show you a contrast between two men in the Bible. One who prayed with a very prideful, uh, pious, I'm better than everybody else mentality, and one who prayed with a very humble and contrite attitude. Listen to the words of Jesus beginning in Luke chapter 18, verse number 10. The Bible says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, watch this pious, proud man. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to, to heaven, but, but, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Look at the contrast in these two men. Here's a man who says, God, I'm sure glad you didn't make me like everybody else. I'm glad I'm not extortioner or unjust. or no. Look how good I am. And not only am I good, but I do good. I fast, I give tithes, I pray. I do all these things. I'm really where I need to be, and I'm a good religious person. And then you've got another man. You've got one man who thought he was it religiously. Then you've got another man. He knew he wasn't. He knew he was in sin just like all of us are. He knew he needed God's mercy. He knew he didn't have a leg to stand on on his own. And he just, he just beat his breast and he said, God, I'm a sinner. I need your help. Please bless me. Jesus said, which of those two went home justified? The one who thought he was right and thought he was it religiously or the one who prayed in humility and knew he needed God's mercy and God's saving grace? Well, naturally, you know the tax collector went home justified because of his attitude. And friend, that brings us to another idea. 
when we pray, let's not make prayer about us. Let's not use this opportunity to have people say, wow, look at how good they can pray or, or look at how religious or, you know, we don't want the focus to be on men. You don't want to pray. Here's what Jesus said. Don't pray like the hypocrites. What do you mean don't pray like the hypocrites? Let me illustrate that for you. Notice Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse number 5. Jesus said, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street. Here's the reason, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. When you've shut the door, pray to your Father who is in heaven, your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Don't have a, an, an attitude of, I want this to be an opportunity for everybody in church to see the big words I use, to see how well I can string those words together, to see how eloquent I am, to, to, to listen to me and walk away thinking, that man is really religious. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said it's not about you. Prayer is not about, you want to receive the reward of the praise of men? Well, you pray like that and you might, but it's not the reward of men that's really important. It's God's reward, and God wants us to have an humble, contrite heart, to pray from the heart, and to do it not for us to receive the glory, but for God to receive the glory. Here's another very important fundamental about prayer. The Bible teaches that when I pray, I ought to pray in the name of or by the authority of Jesus Christ. I'm to be humble. I'm to pray according to God's will. And, and in my prayer, I need to approach God, as the Bible teaches, through the authority and in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, where do we find that in the Bible? If you're following along, I want you to look in John chapter 14, and I want you to notice what Jesus says in verses 13 and 14. That's John 14, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, and whatever you ask in my name, notice this, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. There's the qualification. There's an if there. If, that's a qualification, that's a condition. If you ask in my name, if you pray in my name. When we talk about praying in the name of Jesus, we're talking about praying by His authority. God, we approach you through the authority and power and in the name of your Son. That's the idea. We're giving God and we're giving Christ the glory and I'm praying according to the will of God. You know, when we think about prayer, we also, in every aspect of worship, prayer not only needs to come from the heart and from the emotion, we want to pray with the Spirit and with the understanding. I want to think about what I'm praying. I don't want it to be just... Uh, mumbling or, or repeating, as Jesus says, some vain repetition that I'm not thinking about. Here's what the Scripture says. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, I'll pray with the Spirit and the understanding, and I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. I want to pray with, with the Spirit. That's the, that's the emotion. That's the human side. We think about all that God's done for us. Think about what a wonderful privilege it is to be a child of God. I, I approach God with humility of spirit and recognize that, that privilege. But I also want to pray with understanding. I want to think about what I'm saying. I want to use the intellect and the mind that God gave me to think about what the Scriptures teach and to pray not only just with my emotion, but with truth and with my intellect as well. And that's a very important part on the subject of prayer. Now, as you think about prayer, I believe, I believe most Christians understand the importance of it. I believe we recognize uh, the fundamentals, many of the fundamentals that the Bible teaches about prayer, but, but breaking that down into something that we take the time to do every day is sometimes the struggle that we face. Now, you answer for yourself. Do you really pray as much as you want to pray or as much as you ought to pray? Do you really take the time to pray like you know God wants you to and to give God the honor and the glory in your life? Well, friend, let me mention just real briefly 
maybe uh, some plans, some guidelines from the Bible that'll help prayer to be more of a practical part of your life. What can I do to, to make prayer more practical, to, to really utilize it in my life? Well, here's some examples. Jesus stands as the prime example of starting your day with prayer. Mark 1 verse 35, the Bible says of Jesus, and in the morning, a great while before daylight, he departed, went to a solitary place, and there prayed. What's a practical plan for prayer? Start every day with prayer. When your feet hit the floor, when you hit the button on the coffee pot, when you stand in front of the mirror to see how you look for the day, remember, prayer is just as important as all those things, more important than all those things, and it needs to be a part of starting every day. You wouldn't start the day probably without, you wouldn't leave the house without brushing your hair or brushing your teeth or, or you know, dressing nicely or whatever you may do in your morning routine. Make prayer a part of that routine. Here's another plan, a practical idea as it relates to making prayer a part of your life and especially your children's life. Daniel chapter 6 is a great example of how to, how to put prayer in our life. Daniel had been told by the evil king, you're not going to, the, the, the command went out, uh, when you hear the sound, you're only to pray to this image that uh, the king has made. Anybody who doesn't do that is going to be placed in prison or is going to face a heavy penalty. And so in Daniel chapter 6, when Daniel heard that prayer, Daniel, in defiance of the king and in honor of God, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, prayed three times that day, as was his custom from early days. Daniel had been taught at a very young age and had made prayer a good habit. Friend, there's nothing wrong with having a habit of prayer, is there? There's some very good habits that we have, and, and I want to make prayer a habit in my life. You want to make it a, a habit in your children's life, a good habit, something that the day doesn't feel right if I don't do that in my life. Well, here, here's another example of prayer, and another practical plan for prayer. Prayer ought to be... Um, a private time between me and God where I can communicate to God, where I can get away from the, uh, how life may be uh, running so fast and how it may be hectic at times and I can get away from all that and I can take time just to communicate with God. Remember Matthew 6 verse 6? Jesus said, unlike the hypocrites who want to stand on the street corner and pray the long prayers to be heard of men, Jesus said in you, when you pray, go into your room whether it be closet, whatever it may be, shut the door and there pray to God. Prayer is a, a time to communicate with the Father and to give Him the honor and the glory. Psalm 55 verse 17, the psalmist said, Morning, evening, and noon, I cry unto you. There's a good practical plan. Pray in the morning. Pray at noon. Pray at evening. All three of those are very important things that the Christian ought to incorporate into making prayer a practical part of his life. Now, let me mention some things specifically, and, and this list is by no means exhaustive, but let me just briefly mention some things that the Bible teaches Christians ought to pray about on a regular basis. Number one, the Bible teaches we ought to pray for the lost. Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38, Jesus looked out on the multitudes of people and He said to His disciples, Pray, the harvest is plentiful, the, the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of hosts will send laborers into His harvest. Pray that the gospel can be taken to the lost. Pray that lost souls can be saved and that when men and women can, can, can overcome sin and become a part of God's family. Pray to Every day, pray to overcome sin and temptation. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6, or He taught His disciples in Matthew 6, lead us not into temptation. Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Every day, I'm going to face temptation. Every day, the devil's going to do his best to defeat me, to, to, to lure me, to tempt me to sin. I need to pray for the strength to overcome that. Uh, we need to pray as Christians for forgiveness. Acts 8, verse 22 through 24. Simon the sorcerer fell into sin, and Peter told him, Repent and pray that the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. And so I want to pray that if I've sinned in my life, God will forgive me. Every time I pray, I want to pray something along those lines. I want to pray for those who are, are sick and those who are suffering. 
is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders. Let them pray over him. And the idea is the prayer of faith will save him. If someone's sick, if someone's hurting, if someone's lost loved ones, I want to pray for God's hand of healing and mercy to be upon them. And naturally, as we mentioned earlier, here's another item that all of us definitely need to pray for regularly. I want to pray for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro by the wind. I need the, the wisdom, the ability to, to take God's truth and insert that in my daily life, to know how to apply God's teaching in such a way that it'll help me to live a life that honors God and that brings glory and honor to others as well. Now here's the thing that we definitely ought to pray for regularly. 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 3, the Bible encourages Christians to pray for kings, leaders, and for all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. What do I pray for? I'm going to pray for the leaders of our world. I'm going to pray for the leaders of our government. I'm ultimately going to pray that they'll obey the gospel and live according to the Bible, but I'm also going to pray that they'll allow Christians to live their lives in such a way that it brings glory to God and that they can reach the lost and save them in a world full of sin. And so as we've thought about prayer today, our hope in doing this is that, that each of us will be encouraged to be a people of prayer and, and that when we pray that we'll bring God the glory and the honor because we're praying in faith, we're praying for the things God wants to, and we're making prayer a practical part of our life. Listen to this beautiful verse about prayer. The Bible says this in Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Did you know that through prayer you can approach God's throne and ask for God's blessings, praise Him, and, and give God the honor and glory. We well, friend, we hope in your life that you're giving God the honor and glory. If you've never obeyed the gospel and, and you'd like to learn more about what to do to become a Christian, how to obey the Lord's plan of salvation, just write to us or email us, call us. We'd love to help you with that. And always, we want to encourage every person to live their life in such a way that it brings God the glory and the honor. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.